Hi, and welcome back to the Christian Minute podcast. My name is Anne Markey, and I am joined today by a guest. Her name is Gina Habig. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I love meeting people online and talking about our stories and things from scripture. Um, and I just hope that our conversation can encourage others. So mm -hmm. to get started, can you tell me just a little bit about your background and how you first came to know God? I remember at age four coming to my mom and asking her to pray with me. I don't think I really understood the gospel till I was 30 years old. So 26 years later, I felt like I finally understood that Jesus didn't just give me a ticket to heaven. He gave me a new life. He gave me a new desire to want to serve him. And I think a, a huge piece of that was not understanding the Holy Spirit empowers me to mm -hmm. live a life that pleases God. Instead, what I thought is, okay, I got the ticket to heaven. I'm not going to hell. However, I have to work really, really hard and kill myself to please God. Not that I could earn salvation, but more of a, I wanted to, I never wanted to feel like I was, you know, on God's bad side, I guess you can say. So kind of like a parent, I saw him as like an angry parent, I guess. And I think that corresponded with my upbringing. I was up, uh, brought up in a very strict Baptist home where it was very much rule-based and everything was centered around the church and their culture. And so I, I just thought I had to constantly continue to earn my way to God's mm -hmm. happiness, but I didn't see it more. I didn't really see it as I was earning salvation. I hope that makes sense. No, it does. I think when you're younger, like you really try to follow like all those rules mm -hmm. and then realizing like, oh, why am I feeling so guilty about this that I can't do this and realize, well, like. Nowhere in the scripture does it say we actually have to read our Bible every day. I mean, you know, it says read your Bible and we know it's good for us and it's a good thing to do. But when we're not measuring up, I think the devil does a really good job of telling us like you're a horrible Christian. God doesn't want you like all these things. And so it's this mix of like the church conversation, but also the devil taking advantage of those things and like keeping us down and guilty and ashamed and all those things. Well, I think the, a piece uh, we could mention is, and, and I'd love to hear your side of it, but the picture of being pointed to Christ as mm. being the one who did it all. Yes. You know, so when people would sit down with, with me and go over Colossians 3, they would skip the part of chapter 1 and 2, which tells me who Christ is. Hmm. And just tell me, stop sinning. Stop doing this. Okay, but how do I do that in my own strength? I can't. And so that's the, I think a big piece of it is, are we pointing that person to Christ? Or are we pointing them to more obedience and laws? I, I mean, I've seen exactly what you're talking about, because um, I think about the purity culture in the 90s. And it was exactly mm -hmm. this. It was very rule based. It was very demoralizing. And none of it was pointing us to Christ. It was all very much like, oh, if you do one thing, then you're completely ruined. And I mean, it was just like really mm -hmm. bad framing of this yeah. conversation. And I find like yeah. one of the things I've noticed lately is it has shifted to more like, well, why, like, why is it bad to have sex outside of marriage kind of thing? And pointing it back to like, well, because the church is a symbol of the bride and the groom. And, you know, and it's like, oh, I didn't realize, like, you never gave me the God piece. You just told me that it was bad and that it would ruin me. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're absolutely right that, you know, when we're telling our kids, okay, well, you know, like your shirt's too long, your shirt's too short or whatever, you know, we have to give them that God piece. Otherwise, yeah, I think you miss that personalization. And I don't know, like as a mom, I, I don't always know how to do that. <laughs> and I kind of worry that I'm also kind of like not helping my kids have a personal relationship with them, like with the Lord. But um, I, I feel like we're a lot, I'm trying to be a lot more conscientious about, okay, like this isn't about do this, don't do that. But like, why? And how does this affect your relationship with God? And like, how does God fit into this scenario? It's the context. 
where's the context? Yeah, for yeah. sure. I know today we're talking about glorifying the Lord. So maybe let's just talk about like for you, what does that mean? Well, when I think of glorifying the Lord, I think the first thing is defining glory and glory is not something that can be added. It's something that already is. And that's what the Bible teaches about God's glory is that it's inherent to him. So things like, um, his reputation, um, his, um, being reverent to him. So when we, the, the first thing I think about is Isaiah six, one to four, when the heavenly creatures are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, why did they not say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. The whole earth is full of his holiness. Why did they not say that? Well, because they were describing what glory really was. And it's the purity, it's the it's the majesty of who God is. So I think that's the first thing. Um, mm -hmm. Just like what we were talking about, I think if you would have asked me this question 20 years ago, I probably would have said that glory has to do with what I am doing to add to God's glory. Oh, interesting. So glorifying yeah. God has to be connected to uplifting who he is. And I think the first thing that we do is what you and I've talked about is acknowledging first that we didn't really understand the full gospel and believing on the full gospel. I think that's the first thing. And then of course, repentance and then continuing faith. And then thirdly, I think that it goes into practice things like, you know, loving others and depending on God, trusting in him, even, and this is one we don't like is glorifying in his discipline. Because when we glorify in his discipline, we become more like him, which is what he says in Romans 8, 28 to 30, I think it is, that he is going to be bringing us to full glorification through making us into the image of God. But that doesn't happen in a in a vacuum. And even if we look to the, the life of Christ, it says he learned obedience. So if he learned yeah. obedience, he had to learn how to walk in the way, even though he was 100% God and also 100% man, he still had to fulfill all righteousness by living a life that we could never live. And he yeah. learned obedience. He was the model of what it meant to glorify God. And we look to his life to see how it's demonstrated. But I think a lot of times it becomes more of a performance. And I don't, I don't think that doesn't all, I think depending on the motive of the person, some of that could be like, it's glorifying if we serve in the church, it's glorifying to help the poor, it's glorifying to discipline our children, all of that's glorifying. But what is the motivation? Is it so I can look good and people can go, oh, look at so-and-so is a good Christian mother. No, if it's not pointing to God, it's not glorifying him. And then you think of um, Psalm 19, where it says the heavens are declaring the glory of God, the skies proclaim his handiwork. So all they're doing is giving praise to what already is glorified. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, the way I think about it is like, you're just shining the spotlight on who, like the person of God, because he is already mm -hmm. full of glory, as you've said. So I like the way you put it, that we're not like, we're not adding to his glory. We can't but we can lift up his glory or at least like point towards his glory and also like focus on his glory instead of, you know, ourselves and our works and our abilities and all those things. And I think it, like you said, it's really easy to fall into the trap of like, well, I want them to know that I'm a good Christian. So I'm doing this, this, and this when, okay, maybe what you're doing is really great things and you're helping to build the church, but your motivation isn't to lift God up. And so, you know, I, it's not as glorifying to the Lord as it could be. If our attitude was like, if nobody tells me what a great job I did, I don't care. Cause I want people to know Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think and that was the shift I had to make because I wouldn't have been like that years ago. Yeah. So talk me through a little bit about maybe the steps between like re realizing that you weren't necessarily glorifying the Lord to where you are today. So I will, I'm not going to mention who this is because I don't recommend this author. 
<laughs> but I will say this book was very good and very biblical because where I needed to be confronted is that nothing I could do could ever please God yeah. in the same way that Christ pleased God. And so the book basically contrasted what God says is good and what you think is good. Mm. And that blew me away because that confronted me at my, my core of my problem, which was I needed to realize that Christ's work was not only good enough to get me to heaven, but was good enough for me to rest in and to mm. stop running this hamster wheel. So my 20s were just this hamster wheel of running around looking for this Bible study, going to this conference, thinking there's a special secret I have not found. And there was, I, it just was the gospel. <laughs> I didn't know that. So I just kept, oh, this book looks good. And so, but you know what? The spirit, and this is what my mom and I were talking about. The spirit led me that long so that I can have something to share with someone else. Yeah. And that's, that's the big thing is that there's a lot of people I grew up with, maybe 2% of us are still walking with the Lord, maybe. Yeah. And that's scary. But yeah. thank God, I'm not one that had to go through something worse than what I already did, which all I really did in my 20s, I got married very young and just thought all my problems would go away since I met a completely different, like my husband's upbringing, he saw more of the gospel okay. and I saw more of the loss and he, he's okay. five years older than me. So he's not much older than me, but he just happened to see something, get a little something different, which was great because it, it, God used that to teach me, to mm. get me to realize, okay, I need to be in the word and I need to stop seeking some kind of special answer. And I think, I think that the two things that you've said that stand out that I kind of want to go back to is this idea of like, you know, even though you got saved, you know, younger and, and didn't really make it personal into the, your thirties, that time in between, it can feel like lost time. But what I love is that the Lord still redeemed it. Mm -hmm. That, yep. that to yep. him, yep. it's not lost time because you're using it then to encourage other people and putting the spotlight back on him. So I think sometimes we can get trapped in this idea of like, oh, I've lost all this time. I haven't made the most of my time, um, you know, and have that guilt. Whereas in realizing like, no, I'm not perfect. I may have some lost time, but God can still redeem that time and use it for his glory. Um, and I always think that that's amazing. I mean, you think of the children of Israel and how much time they lost, but how much of their story we learn from because of that, right? So mm -hmm. God can use all these things for his glory because of who he is. Um, and all we have to do is like shift that mindset to say, okay, it, I mean, is it sad that I lost that time? Sure. But I don't need to sit in that sadness i can use it to encourage other people yeah that's exactly right and then just this piece this like combination of the gospel and the law and how you learned about that through your husband and i think the lord has an amazing way of using marriage in our spouses to show us a different not a different gospel, but like different pieces of himself. And I mm -hmm. find like with my husband, it's very similar because he grew up in a non-Christian home and mm. the, um, the organizations that he was part of that he got saved through was very much like relationship based and um, just a different way of looking at things. And so learning from each other in our marriage and figuring out like, okay, how do we take both sides of what we learned now to like apply it to the way we raise our children and the priorities that we have in our life? When you understand the gospel, you're no, you're, you're no longer enslaved to the law. The law yeah. kills is what Roman says. The law kills. And so in Christ, the law is still in, important, but the law is our 
schoolmaster. It is to instruct us. It is not to kill us. And the Israelites, they were to see through the law that they needed a savior. That was the whole purpose of the law in their case. Yeah. And like we can't actually they have these thinking. requirements. <laughs> And that's where the Pharisees went wrong because then they kept thinking, well, the more laws I do, which was basically just another form of what we've been talking about, that they yeah. were doing to try to be right with God. And God is saying, no, this is to show you, you can never keep my law perfectly. This is to show you how holy I am and how much you need me to save you completely. And that's what the prophets kept telling them, but they still didn't get it. <laughs> I mean, I always think like there's probably a million different ways to look at this, but I think it's what we've said a few times before is just coming right back to the gospel, coming right mm -hmm. back to who God is and his and his character and how that shapes the way we think about our relationship with him, but also the way we relate to other Christians. And I think we can have this impact of sharing more about who God is and bringing it back to scripture. Can you maybe provide some really practical examples of what that looks like to live for the glory of God in your life? Well, I think the first thing is if you don't know the gospel, you don't know Christ, that would be the first step is get to know who your savior is. Mm -hmm. um, because you can't, you can't live if you don't know who he is and what he has done for you. So that's the first thing. Read the yeah. book of John, maybe. Um, and I would read it in conjunction with one of the synoptic gospels, because then you can see more of the, um, the movements of Christ's life, because we know John is evangelistic. So you see it pointing to the savior. And then the other gospels, you see more of the, the everyday life of Christ and how his ministry actually was carried out. So that would be the first step. And then the second step, I think, would be get with a mentor. Mm -hmm. Find someone in your church that can walk you through the steps of what it means to be a Christian um, through the example of their life and through, through the scripture. Um, I think sometimes we focus too much on books, and there's some great books that I'd recommend. But make sure it's Bible-based and it's expositional to scripture instead of someone's you know here's five ways to do whatever like those can be practical and good but let's 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 actually go right to the scripture and see what it says um and then thirdly find a time just like what we were saying in the in the beginning um about there's no law about you must do it at 8 a.m and it must you must do it at 8 p.m Find a time in the day that works for you. I know for one of my friends, when all her kids are napping is the time yeah. she does it. And they all yeah. go down and she goes in the word. And that's like clockwork to her. But she's made it priority because she knows that she can't live without it. So find that yeah. time. Don't make it difficult. Don't, yeah. there's, there, you don't need to read three, four chapters a day. I say start slow. And don't go past the point that you can't understand anymore. And yes. I'm a big believer on studying and reading. So mm -hmm. reading through scripture, if you haven't done it, and start in Genesis and just go. And get yeah. a commentary if you need it, or get a study Bible. If you get stuck in Leviticus, because we all get stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> and and then study. And so what I mean by study is pick a book, pick a short book, pick, pick an epistle, pick Ephesians, um, pick... Uh, Philippians, one of those books that are short and go verse by verse very yeah. slowly. Yeah. And, and go over and over and over until you get it. That's how I think the practical starts. And then the spirit, and I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to say, well, I did this specific thing, so you should do it yeah. too. Yeah. No, I, I want you to follow the spirit. And if you do the, th the what are the four things you um, find out, make sure you know, understand who Christ is in the gospel, get your mentor, find a time. The spirit is going to lead you. Yeah. He's going to lead you. And if it, and I always say this to people that I disciple is make sure what you're doing is connected to Christ. If you ever start going off and doing something like I'll give, I'll give one example. Is I say this example a lot. So let's say you have a neighbor 
and she needs help. She is a widow. She needs you to help her clean her house. So if you're going to clean her house, but it's not connected to Christ, meaning you're just doing it to say, I did my Christian duty or to feel better or to think you're more holy, then you got a problem. That's kind of the test that I always kind of ask myself, okay, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for the praise of Gina or am I doing this for the praise of God? And so I'm very careful when I get involved in things. I don't go out to the church and get involved in 40 things because those things might be good, but they're not, if I'm not doing it to point the person or the people who are going to receive that to Christ, I'm not living for the glory of God. It's pretty, actually pretty simple, but yeah, I think those four steps are really important to start with. And I think from there you can rest. You know who who you worship. I have the same thought about just like some books are good. There are lots of good books out there, but at the end of the day, like going back to scripture, there's been just so many times where we've done book studies or even like so and so like so-called Bible studies but they barely even mention the Bible. And so sometimes we can get caught in this idea that we think we're studying God's word, but if it's not bringing us back to scripture, then we're just studying what somebody has said about God's word. And so I love that you said you have to just go back to scripture, go back to scripture, go back to scripture. And when you gave that example of like Galatians and Ephesians, one of the things that I did or not I did, but at a camp growing up, we'd have morning staff devotions. And one of my favorite things was like for a full week, we would read the same book every morning. Mm -hmm. And so you're Mm -hmm. reading the entire book of Galatians every day for like seven days. And then all you're doing is just talking about the different things that just popped out. And then you start seeing connections and you start seeing how the word of God is alive and moving because on day two and three and four and five, you see new things even though you've already read this book like four different times. And so like that, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It can be just super simple. So I love that you said that and really focus on that because I I totally, this is what I tell people all the time. It's just like, it doesn't have to be an hour, two hours, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It can be one minute, two minutes, three minutes. It's about the quality of time with God, not the quantity. Um, And so that's kind of that basis. And I think it's this like active choice to continue to learn more and seek more. And while we're doing those things, glorifying God will become more like it'll just happen because we're seeking the Lord. So I don't think we need to necessarily add one more task. It's like, oh, and now I have to glorify the Lord. I think glorifying Mm -hmm. the Lord happens naturally when we're spending time with him and then doing the things he's called us to do and glorifying the Lord is just a really amazing byproduct of those things. You said it perfectly. That's exactly what I was trying to get at is that we don't want it to be this extra step. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading my Bible. Now I got to go out and glorify the Lord. Yeah. Well, you just glorified the Lord by reading your Bible. Did you know that? (laughs) You went to, to seek him there and that glorifies God. He, he yeah. is to, he's the one most glorious and he is the one that we worship. And when we're doing that, we're glorifying him. Maybe you're not out there doing something. You see someone at your church doing, maybe this person is involved in all these things and you go, man, I am not doing that. Don't let that just like what Anson, don't let whatever everybody else is telling you to be the standard. Let the Bible be the standard. I think this is where it, it all comes back to you. Anything that turns your attention to you, you need to, that's the big like flashing light to say, stop, wait, wait, wait. this is not about me. Let's turn the focus back to Christ because as soon as it goes to me and has nothing to do with Christ, it has nothing to do with Christianity at that point. So yeah. yeah. And I, that's a big one for me. And also that, you know, like this process, this learning, it does take time. And, and I think that that's the part of just spiritual growth is, you know, as you learn more, you just become more and more like him and realizing what is glorifying to him and not glorifying comes with time. Um, 
but yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation and yeah. so I just really appreciate you just like talking through these things with us. Um, and just maybe share with us if somebody's listening and watching and they want to connect more with you, how they can find you, um, and get to know you more. Yeah. So my, uh, all my social medias are just my first and last name. Um, I think Instagram, it's the opposite, uh, H A B I G dot Gina. My goal is to help women to study the Bible, but to connect it to the context of the gospel in Christ. I've been, I've taken Bible classes and now I want to give the information to people so they don't sit there with four or five books and go, I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. So that's, that's basically what I'm doing now. And so if that's something that's interesting to you and please uh, reach out to me, uh, my website is also standing on foundations with an S on the end standing on foundation. So the goal of that to be, I want to build you, help you build a foundation on what scripture teaches yes. instead of telling you to go to a book because yeah. those books are great, but let's, let's start with the word. Amen. Well, thank you, Gina, for spending this time with us. And if you're interested to kind of connect with Gina and the things that she's created, I'll make sure to add the links in the description um, and so that you connect with her there. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that all of you get a sense of just, yeah, we're not telling you just add another task, but just really framing it in how does this all point back to Christ? And are you lifting him up? Or are you lifting yourself up? And I think that's kind of where this all starts. Yep, exactly. Perfect. Well, thank you again for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll come back and we'll see you at the next episode. Bye. Bye.